So we're doing a uh, following up from Easter by looking at other people brought back to life. Uh, whether, uh, and so we saw last week how Elijah was able to bring a widow's son back to life. And, and if we kept reading there through 1 Kings into 2 Kings, we would find the story of how Elijah's successor, Elisha, also brought someone back to life. Uh, another uh, young, young son that, uh, that passed away suddenly. And so we see this as a trait of these two men of God there in, in the Old Testament, these prophets. So now when we, we sort of move from there, we come into the New Testament and the ministry of Jesus. And that's where we pick up today in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 begins with a story that I think, a story, I don't mean like a fiction story, but just an account of things that happen that are uh, surprising. Okay. And it, it involves a centurion, a Roman soldier. I'm going to read this. We've already read the, what will be our main text for the day. But I want us just to get a, a sense of what's going on around our text. Starting in verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and said, sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. And so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him. Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. I could preach a sermon on this, but I just want to highlight a couple of, of points here. We get a sense for the distance between Jews and Gentiles in the very beginning of the story. Here we have a Roman. He's a Roman that you know, has come, been stationed in Judea, in Galilee, Capernaum area. And uh, he, he, as he observes the Jewish life, he's attracted to it. And so he, he admires the Jewish life and, and then he sees an opportunity to help them out and he contributes money to build a, a synagogue for them. Now, they're a pretty good guy. A godly sort of person, God-fearing sort of person. And then his servant is sick. He cares deeply about this servant. And he says, what can we do? We're told that he hears about Jesus. So you would think, okay, centurion, he goes out and gets Jesus and brings him home. But the distance between the Jew and the Gentile is such that he chooses instead to send the local synagogue leaders to Jesus. And he says, and they are the ones who advocate on behalf of this centurion. 
And they go and they say, hey, look, Jesus, we want to tell you about this guy. We know he's a Gentile. We know normally we don't ask favors or do favors for Gentiles. We know normally we keep our distance from them. But what we'd like you to do on this time is listen to his request, will you? Would you consider it his? He's really good. This is what he's done for us. And so it's like, oh, Jesus says, okay, well, that's surprising. But yes, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, and they head off to his house. On the way, they run into a second group of friends. And the second group of friends that the centurion's, centurion's friends has sent, and they say, Jesus, don't even come to the house. Okay? Don't come to the house. And he has this thing about, you know, you can give orders. He recognizes the authority of Jesus. He says, Jesus, you don't even need to, to do anything. You can just speak and it's done. And, and, and what I find amazing is that Jesus finds this amazing, right? That, that Jesus is amazed at the faith of this centurion. And he says, I've been preaching and going places all around Galilee for, for some time now, and I have not met anyone with this degree of faith. The... the Jesus doesn't even need to be present in order to, to heal. Remember, when, oftentimes Jesus would go into a village and he would preach and then we're told that um, the, the sick were brought to him. You know, so there was clearly this sense that those who were sick had to be in his presence, had to be with him in order for him to heal. The, the story of the, the lame man let down through the roof, right? His friends dig a hole in the roof and, and let him down. He had to be in the presence of Jesus in order for that to happen, right? That's the, the understanding there. That the friends couldn't just, didn't feel like they could just go to Jesus and say, Jesus, we got this situation. We got this friend, but he's lame. And he can't get to see you. Can you just heal him, you know, long distance? Instead, they said, no, we've got to bring him. He's got to be there. And Jesus has to see him and do whatever it is that Jesus does to heal him. And so it's the, it's the Roman that says, Jesus, I know you don't even need to come into my house in order to do this. This second group of friends goes back to the house. The servant is healed. And so there's two things, probably more, but two, two things that are immediately obvious. And that is that one, Jesus has great authority. That, that's what the centurion understands and recognizes as a soldier, somebody in a very um, firm or, or rigid authoritarian structure, hierarchy. He understands authority and he sees Jesus as having that authority. The other thing is he has great faith. And we can say on the basis of the faith that that was why the uh, servant was healed, right? Because the centurion had demonstrated faith in God in building the synagogue, for the people, and also then in sending them to, to Jesus. And so we often see this connection in the miracles or the healings of, of Jesus is this connection between faith and being healed. Your faith has made you whole, you know, that kind of idea. But we're going to see something different now when we come down into the next account. There's a gap in between these two stories. It's, it begins in my Bible by saying, soon afterward. Okay? So we don't know how soon, but there's, there's a bit of a gap here. It's not as though it's later on in that day. It could be a week, it could be a month, or whatever later. And um, Jesus is walking with his disciples. He walks to lots of places. Now, we don't know exactly where this town is. It's a very small town. Uh, people, different people make different guesstimates of to where it might be. But it's somewhere in Galilee, not that far from Nazareth. You know, not that far from Capernaum, where, where Jesus, uh, the area that Jesus grew up. And as he's walking and approaching the town, he sees this funeral procession. 
Funeral processions were hard to miss. Okay? Just as you know, we do, you, know, you see the hearse, you see the, the family cars, and then you see all the other cars you know, with their, their blinkers going, and uh, you just, we, we don't miss it. Right? We know what's going on. A little bit different in, in their culture. In their culture, um, it's a fairly warm, humid culture. And so they would, when somebody died, you know, depending, I guess, on the time of day, but really within 24 hours, they would want that person to be buried. Um, and they would anoint the body and uh, take it out to wherever their, their family cemetery was. And so when he sees this funeral procession, it's somebody let's, that may have just died that morning. The mother, as he, he sees the mother, is, is coming to terms with this, the shock. It's the same day or the next day that it happened. And they didn't use coffins like we use coffins. Right? They would wrap the body, but it's on a, a plank, right? just being carried like a stretcher maybe. So being carried on a stretcher. So it's easy to, easy to see, easy to recognize what's happening. Then there are, sometimes you might have heard them talked about as professional mourners. Okay? And, and sometimes we take that as a negative, right? As though these people go around and they make money you know, by wailing and, and carrying on. But, but when we say professional mourners, that's probably not really what we're thinking of. In a small village, there would be you know, leaders, elders of the village. We might say they're professional elders. Doesn't mean they're paid for it. That was their role in the village. There would be some women that were midwives. Doesn't mean they're paid to be midwives. That was just their role in the village. That when a child was being born, those women would be there. Same with a, a death. And, and this role of these mourners, professional mourners, was they would make a lot of noise. And the reason, one of the, a, 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 a really helpful reason they did this was to take the attention away from the family members who are going through their own grief. And so rather than everyone just staring at the family members and, and the spectacle that perhaps they're making of themselves, they're now just mixed in with this group of people that are grieving together because everybody in the village, uh, you know, knew this individual. And there were some people that had that role of being more exuberant in their, or enthusiastic in their grief than others. Jesus sees all of this happening and is moved, King James, moved with compassion. NIV says his heart went out to her, to, to the mother. You see, where they were taking her son was to the cave or the place where her husband was already buried. She's a widow. At some point, her husband has taken this same journey, perhaps on the same stretcher, to the same place. He's laying in that tomb for a period of time. And then, however much later, they've, they've come to that tomb and they've kind of gathered his bones and put them into a box that stays in the tomb on a shelf. There's space for the next family member. And that is where they're taking her son. The preparations have been made, but she never imagined it would be quite like this. Jesus sees her, his heart goes out to her. Uh, one, one person I read described her as an orphan widow. Right? Not that her parents had died, but her family, her children, her son has died. Her uh, husband has died, an orphaned widow. And so her future looks bleak at this point, never mind just the loss of people that she loves, but her welfare moving forward is 
tenuous. And so Jesus is moved with compassion. I wonder what our picture of Jesus is. When you picture Jesus maybe on the Sermon on the Mount or in his teaching or speaking to the 5,000 before he feeds them, how do you picture his demeanor? Most of us, I don't think, don't picture him joking because he's dealing with very serious topics. But maybe is he a stern college professor? Is he a salt of the earth kind of guy who doesn't mind getting his hands dirty? Do you picture Jesus as tall or short? Do you picture him mostly as the guy who preaches the Sermon on the Mount and who rebukes the religious leaders when he sees wrongdoing? And can you take all those images and then can you sort of say, what does it look like for this same person to be moved with compassion? To have his heart go out to her. What does his face look like? What's his demeanor at that point in time? Now when we come across this story, really any story, whether it be in Jesus or in our lives, motive is important, isn't it? Because we could see something happen. You ever done this? Somebody's maybe seen you do something. And they say, oh, they're just doing that to get attention. Oh, no, they're just doing that, you know, to impress someone. They're just doing that to make up for something they did before. And, and so we see an action, and it doesn't matter how good the action, we can quickly assign motives that aren't good to that action. And so when we look at, at Jesus, we can say, what is Jesus doing? We know he's going to bring this son, we've read the story, this, this son is going to come back to life. What is the motive of Jesus? Is this an opportunity for him to say, Hey, everybody, I've arrived. Right? Get up. Go home. Because I'm God in the flesh. You see, if that's his motive, then it becomes about him, doesn't it? You see, the fact that somebody has been restored to life from death is secondary to Jesus showing everybody who he is and how great he is. It's the spotlight on me, right? And, uh, and, and so motive is important. I, I think that's why Luke in this story tells us his motive. Jesus goes over to talk to the family, to talk to the people in this procession because he's moved with compassion. That's his motive. His motive isn't a look at me, I'm the greatest person to ever walk on the earth sort of motive. His motive is, I can tell that you're a widow, maybe by the way you dress, maybe just because of the absence of a husband, but he can tell and he recognizes that her son has died and perhaps somebody tells him all this. And he is moved with compassion. Now, this miraculous display of power, it certainly does enhance his reputation. We see that at the end of the passage. It gets people thinking about who he is. But his motive is to address the hurt that he sees in front of him. This is different from the previous story where the centurion's faith is demonstrated in dramatic ways, in ways that even amaze Jesus, and he responds to that faith okay, by healing the servant. In this instance, nobody approaches him. In this instance, there's no expression of faith. In this instance, Jesus simply sees a need. He is moved by that need. And he does something about it because he can. And so I think that sometimes 
in our efforts to be good stewards of all that God has given us. We might feel that we should only donate our money or only use the church's money for things that directly relate to preaching the gospel. But here, Jesus shows in most dramatic fashion that helping people simply because they need help is the gospel. Why do we support the high school that we support? Do we expect there to be 50 kids coming to church next Sunday because we handed out some backpacks last week? We're not putting a gospel tract in in every backpack and, and expecting baptisms to come because of that. What we're doing is we're saying, here's a need. And us helping and addressing that need is a part of the gospel. It's similar with the diapers. Why do we give away the diapers? Yeah, we ask people to come to the church. They know there's the church that's doing it. But again, it's not a requirement that they have faith. It's not a requirement that they come and hear a sermon before they get their diapers. It's not a requirement that they fill out a questionnaire and say, did you watch this sermon online and did you take notes and can you answer the quiz that comes at the end of the sermon? We just give them the diapers because they need diapers. And it's even possible that some of the people that come won't need diapers, but they just come and get them anyway. And we do it because on the For the most part, we're giving to people that have a need. And that's what Jesus does. No prerequisites, no quizzes, no demonstrations of of great faith, just moved with compassion. And he helps them. I think there's something there that we can learn from Jesus. Second point that I have here is that purity defeats impurity okay and by purity i'm not talking about usually in in, often in churches when we talk about purity it's in the context of sexual purity i'm not using that word i'm talking more in the uh old testament sense of of whether something is impure uh like think more like water you know or uh a food you know they talk clean or unclean pure and impure so when jesus sees this funeral procession, he goes over there. Now, we already just read a story. How did Jesus heal the servant? He just talked, right? And the servant's healed from a distance, didn't go in the house. So did Jesus need to go over to the funeral procession? He just clicked his heels, snapped his fingers, done, twitched his nose, whatever it is. He could have done that and the son could have come to life. But Jesus goes over there. Why does he do that? You say, well, that's, he's moved with compassion. That's what we do, isn't it? When we're moved with compassion, don't we move towards that person? Right? We want to be with them. We want to comfort them. We want to support them. We want to say something, encourage them. And Jesus moves towards his family. But then he does something else that he doesn't need to do. He touches the sun touches the, the stretcher that he's on. And according to Jewish law, that immediately makes him ceremonially unclean. But here's this thing about Jesus. Is that whereas we often move through a world and think about all the things that can corrupt us, Jesus looked at it differently. Jesus moved through the world and said, look at all the things that I can purify. Look at all the things that I can improve, that I can change. Look at the impact that I can make as I move through the world. And we see this as Jesus touches lepers, touches other unclean people. His purity overwhelms their impurity. I know I've shared with you many times at the end of the book of Ezekiel, this image of, of water flowing out of the temple from Mount Zion and it flows down 
to the Dead Sea, where the water isn't just absorbed into the salt and becomes dead itself. Rather, the water brings life to the Dead Sea. And it fills with fish and trees and all sorts of different things. And, and this is the way that as, as people of God and the, the Word of God and the mission of God and the kingdom of God expands out, that it purifies and cleanses what is unclean. Now, many of you perhaps have, are familiar with that verse that uh, I, I'm sure that we're convinced is put in the Scripture particularly for teenagers, right? It's in that chapter that's all about teenagers. And it says, bad company corrupts good character. Right? Anybody ever used that on their team? <laughs> Anybody have that used on them as a teen, right? <laughs> bad company corrupts good character. Okay, now, I don't want to take away this tool out of the parent's toolbox, um, but there are two things to note about this verse. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. The first thing to notice is that it's in the middle of this conversation that your teenager has no interest in whatsoever. It's a conversation about whether or not the resurrection, the afterlife, is a real thing. Okay? And um, it's in that context that he's talking to people that are... Uh, in, in the church in Corinth, and there are some people that are arguing that there is no afterlife. And so Paul, what he is saying is, stay away from those people that are teaching that there's no afterlife. Right? That are Christians, that are trying to be Christians, that, that are teaching that. He says, stay away from that, they'll mess you up. So it's not exactly in that chapter written for teenagers. The other thing that's of interest is that this is a quote from a Greek... Um, it, 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 your Bible may have a note at the bottom, right? There's this Greek writer that was the source of this quote. You think, oh, it's Paul that wrote it, or, or God gave it to Paul. But no, it's in another book. We can go look it up and we know who wrote it. Bad company corrupts good character or good morals. And, uh, and so when... Because it comes from another source, and we can identify this, what we, what we realize is that this statement is a proverb. It's a wisdom statement, not an absolute. And so we can, I think, recognize that there's a risk to hanging out with bad company. We can put a different number on how great that risk is, but we can say there's a risk that that company will corrupt us. But it's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. It's an observation that is often true. And see, here's why it can't always be true. Because at some point, you and I were bad company. Right? You and I were the people that weren't in church, that weren't Christians, that weren't following Jesus. And if somebody hadn't said, I'm going to go hang out with that person. I'm going to go hang out with them. I'm going to go and talk with them about Jesus. Then you and I wouldn't be sitting here today. You see, in order for the gospel to be transmitted from a believer to an unbeliever, the two have to come in contact. There's a... Well, I'll come to that. Um, Jesus himself was pure and holy. Now, he leaves heaven, the pure and holy place, to enter a world under the curse of sin. Do you think as Jesus went out the door, God the Father said, Now remember, bad company corrupts good character, Jesus. Because everywhere Jesus went were people of ill reputation. <laughs> All everywhere he went, there were sinners. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 5, we're told that the light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. It's in reference to Jesus, that Jesus comes into the world, that Jesus is the light. And, and it's amazing that darkness can't overcome light. 
Darkness has no way of putting out a light. Okay. The light can go out, but the darkness has no control over that. The darkness isn't a force. The darkness is simply an absence of light. And so the darkness can't overcome the light. And so when Jesus comes into the world, he says, yeah, I'll let your light shine. Because the darkness has not, will not overcome it. And for us to impact the world in the way that God wants us to, we need to live in contact with the world. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus there tells his disciples to be, um, to be a light on a hill. Right? A, a light on a lampstand, a city on a hill. But then he talks about Christians, his, uh, his followers, his disciples, as being salt. You are the salt of the world. And he warns them about losing their saltiness. So it can happen, right? The, the salt can lose its saltiness. And that's a risk. We understand that. The thing about salt, you put it on your food. It has to touch the food. You can't put a salt shaker or a jar of salt in the middle of the table and let the aroma of the salt sort of infuse your food with more, more flavor. A, the salt doesn't have a flavor, an aroma, does it? B, it just doesn't work like that. You ha the salt has to touch the food. There's an old uh, book, it's about evangelism, but the, the title captures this idea well. It says to the church, out of the salt, salt shaker into the world. Out of the salt shaker into the world. You see, sometimes as Christians, we can you know, be so concerned about, are we in the salt shaker? Who's in the salt shaker? Who's outside the salt shaker? The whole purpose of our mission is to get out of the salt shaker into the world, to be the salt of the world, to be the preserving agent of the world, to make a difference. And so... At times, we can be so concerned about the corruptive influence of bad company that we refuse to leave the salt shaker. Jesus touched the dead man because he knew that his purity would overwhelm the impurity. Yeah, we need to be careful, but we need to be careful in two directions. We need to be careful that we don't lose our faith by hanging around with people without faith. We also need to be careful that we're so protective of our faith that we never actually express it or share it. I think we underestimate the power of the holiness and the Holy Spirit that God has given us. And then my third point as we wind up today is whatever challenges or traumas we've been through, whatever we have ahead of us, Jesus sees us. Jesus has compassion toward us. And Jesus helps us. I don't know what your, what your week is going to be like. I hope that it's great. I hope you have zero problems between now and next Sunday. Chances are a couple of us might go through some difficulties somewhere in the next seven days. Chances are you have an opportunity to help somebody going through some difficulties in the next seven days. Because whenever Jesus does something for us, he's also modeling for us what we can do for others. And so Jesus, as, as you encounter your struggles, your difficulties, as you talk with those around you, we can reassure them that Jesus sees us. Jesus has compassion and moves towards us. And Jesus helps us. Now, I understand that very often his time frame isn't what we would like it to be. Right? Because you may have the difficulty this week and it may not be solved by next Sunday. But even as we go through those difficulties... Jesus sees us. Jesus has compassion towards us and moves towards us. 
and Jesus helps us. Not always through something miraculous. Sometimes it's just that, you know, you need to cook a dinner and you don't have a recipe. You call someone at the church. They've got that recipe that you need. And you go, you know, if I wasn't a church, if God wasn't part of my life, I wouldn't have got that recipe. Right? God just used somebody else on the other end of the phone to send you the information that you needed at that point in time. And, and you say, okay, that's, that's nothing that compared to raising the dead, is it? But it's just a, a very simple way that Jesus sees us, has compassion and moves towards us and helps us. <laughs>